hey there everyone hi and welcome back to my YouTube channel thanks a lot for visiting with me today I want to tell you about some very exciting developments in the area of cold fusion and so-called Lenner L-E-N-R low energy nuclear reaction as it's called or low energy nuclear technology different names for it this process these processes have been making the news they've been developing over the past couple of years if you haven't seen my videos about cold fusion and Leonard the, the links are right up here but basically as I talked about in my previous videos we had learned that cold fusion really worked the folks at ENEA in Italy have been working on it and we've been getting some very promising results from Andreas Rossi's ECAT energy catalyzer which we're told is going to be commercialized and possibly for sale at the end of this year 2015 but what we haven't had so far is a theory about why it works well that's all changed quite dramatically in the past few weeks there's a marvelous site that I go to all the time it's one of my favorite sites it's called ECAT world and ECAT world is a site that talks about the ECAT cold fusion Leonard, and all these related technologies and I check this site out all the time because it's always talking about the latest developments. As we've learned, a professor in Moscow, Parkhamov, has uh, reproduced the Rossi ECAT effect with his own very informal setup in his own uh, apartment, I believe. And we've had some replications in California over the past couple days. And a few days ago, I saw this paper that explained the theory of why all of this works. And it has implications for a whole range of subjects that we talk about here on my YouTube channel that I think you'll be interested in. Basically, this paper is called Plasmonics with a Twist, Taming Optical Tornadoes on a Nanoscale by a uh, researcher at in the Mechanical Engineering Department at MIT, uh, Svetlana V. Boriskina. She presents a very interesting idea that is called Vortex nano gear transmission and this is why it matters we know that in cold fusion and lenner we have these different materials that resonate in a way to produce apparently a fusion reaction at an atomic level and it produces a lot of heat and a lot of energy ideally over unity meaning it produces more energy out than in which would lower all of our energy costs and create a sustainable non-polluting energy source but how does it work well, in this paper, she presents a number of ideas that show how energy can move from a micro scale to a macro scale or vice versa, from a macro scale to a small scale using very simple principles from hydrodynamics. Now, these ideas go back quite a ways and let's just review it just briefly for a second. You know, about over 100 years ago or so in the late 1800s, there was all these ideas about how do electromagnetic waves and light propagate through the universe? How does it move if it's just a vacuum? And there was this notion that there was something called the ether, you know, this kind of weightless, uh, hard to detect fluid that filled outer space. Well, the Michelson and Morley experiments showed that there was no ether, and this helped Einstein and many others to create theories of uh, general relativity and so forth. However, because the work in quantum mechanics and physics went the direction of electromagnetics, electromechanics. There was very little emphasis put on alternative theories of how energy moves and resonates. And this is another way to look at it. Essentially, you're all familiar with the idea of seeing a waterfall, lots of energy moving in a river, and downstream you see these vortexes, whirlpools and eddies in a river downstream from a waterfall and things like that. So basically we have a turbulent process that creates a coherent so-called laminar flow in a fluid. Well, this apparently is exactly how we're learning that the ECAT and Lenner and cold fusion possibly work. Imagine something like the dust particles that you vacuum up from your floor. You've noticed that the dust particles create dust bunnies and they create larger and larger bundles of dust. And when you vacuum your floor from time to time, you see large dust bunnies and small dust, un dust bunnies and, and tiny little pieces of dust, and you know it's very small that you can barely see. Well, this idea of vortex nano gear transmission 
suggests the idea that on an atomic scale, if you have something like Lenner, which you have a nickel powder in a hydrogen lattice, that these nickel particles self-organize into different sized particles. Some are very big with lots of iron atoms all hooked together, and some are very small. And if you have enough density of these specially shaped particles, they will self-organize into a chain like gears. And if you have energy coming in at one side, let's say we have electromagnetic energy at a very large scale, the biggest of these particles will react to that electromagnetic energy. And then they'll connect to another smaller particle and smaller particle all the way down the chain of different sized nickel particles until it's at the smallest sized little nickel particle which interacts at the atomic scale where you have the hydrogen atoms and this puts energy into the hydrogen atoms and they start to move which generates the fusion process. So we now have a mechanism, if you're able to follow that, we now have a mechanism that explains how do you go from the large scale of light and microwaves and energy waves, radio waves, where the physics are well established and we have concepts like super radiance, coherently acting atoms in a gas and so forth. How do we go from that macro scale all the way down to the atomic scale where the fusion happens? From this theory of optical tornadoes, which you can imagine light creating vortexes of energy, we now have this, what you would think of as a mechanical process from the largest scale all the way down to the smallest scale to where the atoms work. So rather than being in a state where there's no theory that explains it, like the critics and the skeptics and the scoffers has been suggesting for all these years, there's no theory to explain how this works. Boom, we now have a very reasonable, understandable theory of how the energy process could work, how it could be sustained. And they also go so far, or Eskina also goes so far in this paper to explain another effect, which I think you'll find very interesting. In the previous video I did about Dr. Vittorio Violante at ENEA in Italy, he told us about cold fusion. He told us that the reason that all the other labs didn't get it to work, including MIT, ironically enough, and many other labs, and why the patent office said there was no cold fusion, they were using the wrong types of materials. What Dr. Violante found was that there have to be enough defects in the palladium to get it to interact with the deuterium to get the fusion reaction going. And he, he was unequivocal about it. He said, we got the cold fusion reaction going, I believe at least a couple days. He showed us the chart of the, of the heat that was emanating that goes well beyond any chemical process that we know about. And so you can't have a, per, a material that's too perfect. You need a material with defects. You need imperfections to get the energy going. Don't you think that's kind of cool? Well, in this paper about optical tornadoes and plasmonics, which are basically just waveforms that happen on the surface of metals, they explain why this is true. Again, if we go back to the analogy of the waterfall and eddies and, and swirls and whirlpools that you've all seen in the ocean at times and in ponds sometimes and anywhere where water's moving, water's draining, you need the defects because the defects pin down the vortex to a localized place. It localizes the energy and this is why if you had nothing in the river you wouldn't get into these vortex. You need some rocks there, some in imperfections. So basically we found out that the imperfections you need to get the cold fusion process working are necessary so that the vortices localize and act to affect all the other little gears all the way down the chain to the atomic level. So this particular piece of information explains a lot about how cold fusion and Lenner might work, but it doesn't end there because if you've been following my work for any amount of time, you'll know that I'm interested in crop circles. I'm interested in why crop circles affect our cameras and batteries like we found over many years of going over to England and going into many, many crop circles. And if you just go to this link above, I have a page that just shows videos I've taken of people's batteries and cameras failing. When I just happened to be there, just when someone said, hey, my camera just stopped working as soon as they came into a crop circle, or my batteries just died, or something weird is happening to my electronic device. I've seen this happen many times, but what I've been wondering is how does the process work? 
Well, this might explain the same sort of effect because if you think about it, the crop circle we found that what makes the crop circle seem electromagnetically active is if they're built in a certain shape, certain spiral shape and have a ratio of smaller spirals to medium sized spirals to larger ones all nested within each other in a fractal like way within the field. This suggests that the energy could move from the level of light because the wheat uh, operates through a process like any plant does of taking in light and converting it to energy photosynthesis. Perhaps the opposite of the Lenner reaction, but still very similar, it takes a very small scale reaction like light and moves it through the wheat through some sort of process of motion through the wheat stems, through the field as a whole, and ends up generating a higher frequency uh, type of energy on the electromagnetic scale, moving from light to some sort of electromagnetic level where it actually interacts with our batteries, our cameras, and so forth. So I think this idea of uh, vortex nanogear transmission, plasmonic optical tornadoes could go a long way to explaining a lot of these very weird phenomena that we've seen, particularly having to do with crop circles in this case, perhaps with cold fusion too. And it really all comes down to a very simple concept. Again, resonance. The idea that energy can move up and down the scale of matter. And now that we have some sort of idea of how this works, uh, the author of this paper suggests it could happen in many different types of systems. Maybe this is what we're seeing in these resonant effects that previously have been attributed to paranormal causes really have a solid scientific explanation. It's just an explanation that we haven't really thought very much before because we've been so focused on the electromagnetic side of things rather than on the model that looks more like things as waves, hydrodynamics, and mechanical motion. So another process that this optical tornado theory might explain is even something like remote viewing, resonant viewing. Because if you think about it, we've found that RV works at any scale. You remember the test they did back with Ingo Swan at SRI? They had him and his colleague Hella Hamid and others view micro dots. These are tiny little dots that can't be seen with the naked eye, but that have a picture in them. You know, it's a way to move information around without most people being able to see it. And Ingo was able to view, we're told, view these micro dots just as well as he could view large size objects. How is that possible? He could view something on the smallest scale just as well as something on a huge scale. Well, perhaps we're dealing with a scale-free process similar to this where things can move up the scale of energy down the scale of energy through this type of nano gear transmission, something like that. And the energy and information move up and down and get scaled up or down, just like that. So perhaps this theory also explains other processes that involve resonance like RV. So, you know, one of the interesting implications of this research that I'm always uh, thinking about, I think is pretty cool, is that the idea that systems that have imperfections and defects working better than systems that are perfect is really counterintuitive. It goes against a lot of what you and I learned in school. It's basically that systems, some systems work a lot better. I mean, orders of magnitude better when they have imperfections and defects in them than if they're smooth and work exactly the way you think they should work. So just think about that for a second is that things that are linear don't work as well as things that are bumpy and have lots of defects in them. It's a really counterintuitive idea, but one of the implications of this type of work. Any case, it's very exciting. Uh, the developments in cold fusion and Lenner are happening on a weekly basis now, and who knows, by the end of the year, we may have another type of technology to generate our energy, and perhaps this is why it works. So, in any case, I thought you'd find that interesting. Uh, any questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Take care for now, and bye. Okay, that's good.